Tonight our guest speaker is Danny Sheehan. The topic is the implications of first contact. Daniel P. Sheehan is a Harvard-trained attorney who over the last 40 years has taken on cases and causes to expose injustice, protected fundamental rights, and articulate his vision of humanity's future. Mr. Sheehan has, like so many of us, been fascinated by questions related to UFOs and ETs for decades. In 2001, Danny Sheehan was a legal advisor to the Disclosure Project. When 20 U.S. officials provided sworn testimony to congressional staff on ET and UFO phenomena. He represented Dr. John Mack when he was brought before an academic tribunal at Harvard uh, after the publication of his book, Abduction, in 1994, in an attempt to interfere with his research into UFOs and abductions. Danny Sheehan has been a speaker at the International UFO Congress, which many of you, I'm sure, have attended five times. Mr. Sheehan believes that we are on the verge of a new era, which will be ushered in initially by breakthroughs in quantum physics, and which will commence in earnest when first outright contact occurs, either on Earth or off-world. He has thought at length about the philosophical and public policy implications of first contact, and will share his provocative conclusions with us tonight. Let's give a warm move on Orange County. Welcome to Danny Sheehan. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, want to, I want to thank uh, you for inviting me uh, here tonight. Uh, and I want to uh, apologize for my not having been able to get down last night. I was uh, asked to try to uh, address the, uh, the LA MUFON as well, but I have a class that I teach at the University of California at Santa Cruz uh, called the Eight Cases That Changed America. And, and Last night I was having to give the lecture on the Karen Silkwood case uh, that we did in Oklahoma that uh, uh, stopped the construction of all private nuclear power plants in the United States uh, from 1979 uh, up until this past February when the Obama administration has now issued licenses for two, the first two private nuclear plants uh, since 1979. Uh, and uh, I apologize for not being able to spend more time with you uh, tonight and tomorrow because I have to go back because I have to teach the, uh, the class tomorrow night uh, on the Iran-Contra case that we did that uh, stopped the uh, supply of military equipment to the Contras that were attempting to overthrow the Nicaraguan government in San the Sandinista. Uh, so I, I have to do uh, those and then Friday I have to fly to South Dakota because we're doing a major federal civil rights lawsuit on behalf of the Lakota people there. It turns out that uh, during the W. Bush administration, during the eight years, there were over 5,000 uh, Lakota children were taken away from their Lakota uh, parents and families and, uh, and placed in these major group homes where they were massively dosed with pharmaceuticals uh, ranging from Zyprexa to Zoloft. Uh, and, uh, and we've, we've uh, filed, a, we're in the process of filing a major civil rights lawsuit on behalf of them and their families. So, uh, but, I, but I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, that, that uh, I've been accommodated to come down to be able to talk with you tonight. Uh, and so we can direct our attention for the time that we do have together here tonight on this extraordinarily uh, important and interesting subject of the implications of the first contact with an extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. Uh, this will be actually the third time that I've been asked to address this particular issue. Uh, as was referred to earlier in the opening remarks, I've addressed the International UFO Congress a number of times and uh, the LA MUFON uh, group a number of times. And uh, the first time uh, at the International UFO Congress was back in 1994, turns out 18 years ago now, uh, when I was asked to brief the uh, UFO Congress on the confrontation that was going on at Harvard University uh, with Dr. John Mack, uh, who had been brought up in front of the, uh, the uh, faculty committee, uh, challenging him for his having published the book about uh, international uh, contacts uh, with the UFOs. And, uh, the next time I was asked to talk was at following my, when I was general counsel for the Disclosure Project in 2001. 
uh, I was asked to come back to, uh, to the International UFO Congress and at that time to discuss uh, what my take was uh, on the UFO issue and the issue of extraterrestrial intelligence. And at that time, uh, I laid out uh, a major presentation uh, that uh, discussed the various uh, worldviews that our human family, uh, members, segments of our human family, attach themselves to different worldviews entirely uh, and what the implications are for each uh, group uh, who adhere to a particular worldview uh, so that you see that there are different implications uh, for different groups of people for uh, this whole issue of contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. That was a, a fairly extended uh, and somewhat scholastic and academic uh, presentation uh, predicated upon my studies at Harvard University uh, after graduating from Harvard College and after graduating from Harvard Law School I ended up going back to do my master's work and then PhD work uh, in comparative social ethics. And so the first, the first talk that I gave on this particular topic was uh, quite overly scholastic uh, and, uh, and uh, theoretical uh, relating to the, the different worldviews that people have and how they would approach the issue. As I mentioned, I was then asked to do it a second time uh, uh, in 2001 and, uh, and more recently, I've, I was asked to uh, respond to the Vatican's announcement uh, that uh, they had decided finally that uh, it was quite clear that it was likely that there was extraterrestrial intelligence and that uh, they thought that it was time for the laity, that's us, to, uh, to gather ourselves together and to begin to discuss the, uh, the profound philosophical and theological implications uh, of contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence. So that, that, that discussion is available uh, if you want to see it uh, on uh, a website called openskiesministry.org. Uh, it's openskiesministry.org and it's a long discussion of the theological and philosophical implications of contact. As you can tell, uh, there, there are different ways to approach this particular subject. Uh, some of them are, are more highly technical and academic and scholastic than others. Uh, but tonight, I would like to, uh, in my third approach to this particular subject, uh, discuss the, the issue of the implications of extraterrestrial uh, life and extraterrestrial intelligence uh, from a more a colloquial uh, and popular point of view, so that it is, it's more accessible to, to people in the non-academic and non-scholastic uh, world. Uh, a, a point of view that is far less technical and, uh, and academic. In preparation for this, when, when I was asked by Jamie to make this presentation, I kind of scoured my, the books that I've kind of gathered over the years uh, and have on my shelf in my law office up in Santa Cruz, and uh, I just I took some of these off and set them aside so that when I was preparing my remarks, I would take a look at them to kind of get a sense of an overview of the kind of different popular positions that have been taken uh, on this already. And uh, that I always am inclined to start my discussions of these things with, uh, with Richard Dolan. Uh, that Richard Dolan, uh, I find to be one of the most sound and responsible uh, intelligent uh, minds in the field. Uh, and so that when one looks at his, uh, his very well-known two-volume series of UFOs and the national security state, uh, you come to see a very detailed presentation of all of the different types of encounters that have been had, the type of response that the military has had, the efforts that have been made to suppress press information about this, et cetera. And you come to see that, uh, that it's perceived as a national security issue uh, by the military and the intelligence communities. And so therefore, the implications of contact uh, from the perspective of, of Richard Dolan were political and military, uh, the implications. Uh, and of course, this immediately enmeshes us in the long-standing and long-running debate that has gone on uh, that, has, that has really distracted us uh, for a long time in the UFO community from the more substantive discussion 
of, well, what about it? What about the, the, the implications of this kind of a contact? Because we get diverted into this discussion about, oh, isn't it awful how the government is hiding it all? And why are they hiding it? And you know, how are they hiding it? When did they start hiding it? Did it really happen at, uh, at Roswell? And did they take the bodies to one place or another? And what's going on secretly at, at, at the Area 51? And so we get, we get diverted off into these other discussions. And we don't get back to the, the, the primary discussion of, well, what do you think about this? I mean, what does this mean to you, uh, the, the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence? Uh, then there's the, uh, I, I found the, the old book by uh, Carl Jung. Carl Jung actually wrote a book back in 1959 about the UFO phenomenon uh, in which he actually thought that the implications were primarily psychological. He said that he actually thought that the that UFOs and this whole extraterrestrial uh, beings uh, issue in our human family uh, was simply a photoplasmic projection out into actual material manifestation of a deep set unconscious anxiety on the part of our human family uh, about the potential bad future that might lay in store for us if we're not adequately careful to safeguard ourselves against uh, runaway technology and the suppression of our empathy and love and emotions and that we become over intellectual and scholastic. Uh, and so that he, he had said that, uh, that the, the UFO beings were actually just a projection uh, of our own fears of what might happen to us. That's how we might look. We get atrophied from the lack of exercise because we've allowed technology to do all of our work for us uh, and that our heads get really big because of the intellectual activity. Uh, and, uh, and so that he thought that the implications were primarily psychological and uh, implied that uh, while these phenomena were real, that they were really the actual product of a collective projection of our own unconscious. So the implications of this phenomenon, in his opinion, were primarily psychological. Uh, then, of course, you have the, uh, the, the, the entire school of thought that actually translates the mere anxiety that was identified by, uh, by Carl Jung into a, a full-blown fear uh, of, the, of the UFO phenomenon. Uh, Bryce Zabel majors in this. Uh, Bryce Zabel was the creator of Dark Skies on television and, uh, and was the co-author of the book uh, After Disclosure, AD After Disclosure. Unfortunately, he kind of dragged Richard Dolan into uh, working on this book with him. Uh, but you know, it, it, it reviews things. Uh, Bryce Zabel is primarily responsible for the uh, saying that you know, in trying to set forth a, a series of potential answers as to what they the UFO people uh, might be after, ask questions like, do they want our DNA? Are they after us as food uh, to eat us? Uh, are they after our souls, trying to drain our souls? Uh, or are they trying to take our world away from us? You see, he, he ranges over one bad option after another here, and it's all playing out this kind of full-blown fear uh, of the UFO phenomenon. Uh, it portends the end of all true religion, has adverse, massively adverse uh, economic consequences, the collapse of our economy, all of the governments would be totally discredited, and it would generate uh, a devastating uh, psychological effect upon our human family. Uh, and that's that whole school of thought. Uh, and, and, and then there are others who believe that this would actually break out into full-scale warfare between us as human beings and the, uh, and the extraterrestrial civilization. Uh, it's not just a national security problem. It's not just a, a source of anxiety. It's not even just a source of fear and potential collapse in the face of the, the discovery, but in fact that it would generate a full-scale military uh, conflict. Uh, in these people, for example, the Church of Scientology. Uh, in fact, uh, Ron Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard, uh, the author of Battlefield Earth uh, and others, you know, actually transmuted his own particular early science fiction writing work 
into a full-scale uh, delusion, uh, into actually believing uh, that, that the, uh, the Earth was uh, being attacked by a reptilian uh, culture uh, and that they had overthrown uh, governments and that were walking around running the Earth. Uh, and that it's going to be required that we actually engage in, in warfare against them, openly advocating it. And there, there are others that are of that particular strain. You, you know about David Ikes and, uh, and others that have postulated that whole uh, reptilian horror uh, that is going on. Uh, then on the uh, extreme opposite end of the spectrum, of course, you have, uh, it was, I, I found this really terrific quote from, uh, from Nikola Tesla. Uh, back in 1931, on a front page uh, Time Magazine article, <laughs> in July, July 30th of 1931, he said, I think that nothing could be more important than interplanetary communication and contact. It will certainly happen someday, and the certainty that there are other sentient, intelligent beings in our universe, working, suffering, struggling, just like ourselves, will produce a magic effect on mankind, one that will form the foundation of a new universal brotherhood that will last as long as humanity itself. Uh, and, and, and there are others, of course, the classic of George Adamski uh, that we, uh, the, the older of us in the, in the community are aware of, that George Adamski back in the 50s was totally euphoric uh, about the whole phenomenon of UFOs, the Space Brothers. Uh, and wrote book after book and uh, was bringing people out to meet them that they were the salvation, actually, of our human family. That they had actually come to uh, warn us about the threats of nuclear uh, war and uh, ecological disaster. Uh, and that these are our allies. These are our friends, our, our, our mentors, actually. Uh, and uh, and uh, Marshall Summers has followed up on this particular theme. Uh, the greater community, uh, spirituality, the wisdom of the greater community. Uh, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, community of people in Boulder, Colorado, around uh, Marshall Summers that has that is, uh, extolled the virtues of the, uh, of the UFO people and the beings and how they're coming to, to save us. And there are uh, various forms of this, and it actually goes all the way to the form of another particular uh, reflection on the implications of this that actually have gone so far as to believe that we, in fact, are, in, are the product of a self-conscious breeding program that is going on, undertaken by the, the uh, extra extraterrestrial beings. And this has been laid out in great detail by Zachariah Sitchin, for example, in the 12th planet and his, his Earth Chronicles. Uh, and there are others that follow up on it, uh, suggesting that, that we are, in fact, a hybrid of an extraterrestrial uh, species that has actually engaged in, uh, in gene splicing with early primates uh, of, of, the, of Australopithecus, et cetera, here on our planet, and that we are, in fact, a product of that, and that they're attending to us and taking care to keep an eye on us, and they're, they're kind of uh, nurturing us like a, like a nursery uh, here on our planet. Uh, and, and this has been, this has been uh, actually carried into the full-scale uh, understanding that, uh, that Benjamin Krem and Share International uh, and other, other communities have, have made this an entire spiritual experience of our encounter. So therefore, the implications are spiritual uh, for, for these people. Uh, and, and then there, of course, uh, last and probably certainly least, uh, is uh, John Alexander, uh, that uh, Colonel John Alexander has maintained, uh, just in the debate that I moderated with him uh, last year at the International UFO Congress, he and Stanton Friedman, and uh, Colonel Alexander actually maintains that uh, nobody really cares, that uh, it doesn't make really any difference, uh, that uh, the major vast majority of people aren't really affected by this anyhow, and if we discover extraterrestrial civilization somewhere on another planet, even a highly developed technological civilization, uh, it'll last a few days. It'll be a big, it'll blow over like any other news story because nobody really cares. Uh, now, uh, reviewing, reviewing these kind of more popular uh, takes on 
uh, and perspectives on the implications of contact with an extraterrestrial civilization, I find those are, <coughs> those are extremely different than the kind of highly technological and academic discussion that I've had in the past. Uh, when I would talk with people about this, for example, at Harvard College or Harvard University uh, or various senators uh, and with the Jesuit National Headquarters where I was chief counsel for 10 years in Washington, D.C., those kind of discussions tend to be extremely uh, arcane and, and technical. So the, this, is, this is very different. So the approach that I would like to take this evening to kind of stimulate the conversation uh, among us is the approach that was taken back, basically back in 1990 in a book that you may or may not have seen. It's a, it won the 1990 Hugo Award uh, for, for uh, nonfiction writing. And it's called The World Beyond the Hill. Uh, science Fiction and the Human Quest for Transcendence uh, by Alexei and Corey Pension. And what, what, they, what they basically argued was that the, the entire realm of science fiction, future fiction, the whole discussion about extraterrestrial intelligence and UFOs, et cetera, is an attempt on the part of our human family to collectively uh, restructure the basic beliefs that we have that are religious beliefs, long-standing historical religious beliefs in our human family to restructure these to accommodate the new scientific revolution that has taken place, at least in Western civilization, the, the onset of uh, Newtonian, Cartesian uh, worldview of scientific uh, materialism. That in fact, we need to have a materially based understanding uh, of the same issues that had previously been addressed only uh, in religion. And that therefore, this entire realm of science fiction writing, future fiction writing, discussing the extraterrestrial uh, presence, et cetera, is in fact a radical attempt simply in the 20th century to translate into uh, secular terms the religious beliefs that were so severely impacted by the uh, 17th and 18th century enlightenment and age of, uh, age of reason. Uh, I would like to go a step farther than they did uh, tonight, and I would like to suggest that actually what's going on with regard to the, the type of uh, emotional and, and uh, sentiment uh, about the UFO issue, and the ET issue, because I think all of us will acknowledge that we, we take this somewhat emotionally. Uh, this this like, is not like a lot of other subjects that we all deal with. Uh, the reason that people such as ourselves gather together in rooms like this or even larger gatherings to discuss this issue uh, is, is because we, we feel so strongly about it. And what, the, what I'm going to be arguing tonight is that what we're really attempting to do here in the 21st century is update all of the same kind of understandings that we have about our human family that have traditionally been dealt with in the realm of religion and spirituality, that we're trying to update these beliefs to accommodate the discoveries in the field of science that were made in the 20th century, not just in the 18th and 19th century through the age of reason in scientific uh, revolution. That what we really have come, we have come into contact now with the theory of relativity, uh, special relativity and general relativity, and quantum physics. And that really what we're engaged in now, and the reason that the UFO issue and the ET issue has taken on an air of what we refer to in the community as high strangeness is because we're moving beyond the simple materialist nuts and bolts. You know, can we, can we knock on them? You know, can you walk up and shake their hand? Uh, discussion into trying to accommodate some of these other really extraordinarily strange stories that we hear 
about UFOs and extraterrestrial beings, such as the telepathic communication, the fact that they can kind of pass right through walls, that they can levitate people, that the, the uh, UFOs can pop into uh, material manifestation and then pop out of material manifestation, that they seem to be able to travel faster than the speed of light. Uh, there, there, are, there are a whole series of qualities of the UFO phenomenon and the ET phenomenon that take on this, this quality of high strangeness. That is, I'm arguing tonight, because we're attempting to integrate into this field what we come to know about quantum physics. That the, the, that the universe is made up of a, a sum total of these ultimately non-divisible uh, quantum fields. And that the quantum field a quantum field is neither uh, a particle of mass nor a, a unit of energy. Uh, it is in fact a highly potentiated uh, area that is neither one. And very, very surprisingly that we've discovered between 1923 and 1926 in the 20th century, we've discovered that the, the regularity with which a, a, an inchoate quantum field actually manifests itself either as a particle of mass or as a wavelength of energy, they, they only do so in a completely random fashion. There is no predictable pattern pursuant to which they manifest as one or the other until human intention actually comes into the equation. And that when, in fact, human intention is directed to an inchoate quantum field, willing that in inchoate quantum field to manifest itself in the form of a particle of mass, or for that matter, as a, as a wavelength of energy, that, that that inchoate quantum field will, in fact, so manifest to a statistically significant degree beyond random. Now that, that, is, that is one of the one of those things that was discovered back between 1923 and 1926. And another thing that was discovered was that if in fact you take you take one of these inchoate quantum fields and you you break it uh, and split it and you accelerate the portion of the particle uh, into opposite directions uh, at the speed of light, uh, it, and you actually direct human intentionality toward it, you can turn it away from its straight line that it would otherwise be traveling at, unencumbered. And very interestingly, shockingly interestingly, when you do that to one of the particles traveling away at the speed of light, and it moves out of a straight trajectory, the other half of it moving in the other direction at the speed of light will do so too. So what does that mean? What, th that was just stunning to people when they discovered this. And it began to cause them to believe that not only can human intention have an effect faster than the speed of light, but that in fact there seems to be a unified field within which every single uh, indivisible co uh, in, in coate quantum field actually exists inside a unified field where they are attracted to every other one. And that, so that we, we began to get a whole series of observations in the 20th century through our scientific community that began to, to cause us to challenge the basic assumptions of the Newtonian, Cartesian, scientific, materialist worldview, which had previously unseated the, the religious world. And so that there began to be, then there began to be written late in the 20th century a whole series of books, like Fritjof Capra's uh, books, uh, uh, books of a half a dozen other authors, that began to see very clear parallels between what was being observed in the scientific field during the 20th century and ideas that had existed in the religious field 
and in the spiritual field, specifically with Buddhism and Hinduism. Uh, and so that th this, this began to become the, the, the focus of attention uh, toward the end of the 20th century. And so here we now find ourselves in the 21st century uh, attempting to integrate some of these scientific discoveries into the belief systems that we had from a strictly religious background. Because rather than, than jettison all of the old beliefs that we have from our childhood and training in religious communities, whether they be Christian or Jewish or, or uh, Islamic or Buddhist or uh, any, of, any of the others, that uh, there's a tendency for us to hold on to those beliefs and to try to reconfigure them in some way that remain consistent with our scientific knowledge. And that that is what is going on now. And uh, so what, what I want to do is I, I want to uh, open this discussion among ourselves about what the implications of this are with a, with a, uh, a quote that I heard. I was present for this uh, back, I, I had just graduated from Harvard College and uh, it was in my first year at Harvard Law School. And we received word over at the law school that Crane Brinton, who was the 45-year chairman of the Department of Intellectual History at Harvard University, was going to be delivering his final lecture at Harvard University. And he had been asked to speak to the point of what the single most important idea was that he had ever encountered in his entire career of studying the intellectual history of our human family. And uh, this is what he said. He, he, he gathered that they had to move his class from his normal classroom into Lowell Hall because because hundreds and hundreds of people came from all around the world to be present for this last lecture. And uh, I, I was in the last all-male class at Harvard University. So all of these guys were, all these people were men, actually had come from all around the world that had been in Crane Britain's classes down over the past 45 years. And so <clears throat> they, we all gathered in, the, in Lowell Hall, and he, he got up in front and he said, I've been asked to address this question of what the single most important idea is that I've encountered in my entire career of studying the intellectual history of the human family. He said, I, I'm very clear that it is this. He said, I believe that the greatest minds in the human family have come to share the belief that our human family is standing on the very brink of the next step in our biological evolution. And that we are going to be evolving into a new species that is going to be as distinct from Homo sapien as Homo sapien was distinct from Homo erectus. He said, and that I believe that the greatest minds in our human family have come to conclude that the manner in which this evolution is going to be taking place is going to be the development of a particular new faculty. A faculty like seeing or hearing a faculty by means of which we will each be able to directly, experientially encounter the unitive phenomenon that bonds every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire physical universe into one single unified harmonic whole. And that by means of this experience, each individual is going to be able to intuitively understand what conduct on the part of human beings, both individually and collectively, is either harmonious with or disharmonious to the natural order of the universe. And then he turned, remember this was 1968, December 19th of 1968 at Harvard College, and he turned to the audience and he said, and I think that's why so many of you young men 
refused to go fight in this war in Vietnam. And he closed his book and he walked away and never spoke another word about it. Uh, and so that while it may not be immediately obvious why this particular uh, statement on his part is so important to the subject matter tonight, I want to point out that I believe that it is and that it is directly pertinent because I believe that if we come to discover that there are indeed many other worlds, many other planets, uh, sur uh, circling many different stars, uh, the planets that are inhabited by life, if we discover that that life is simply you know, single cell bacteria, we're not going to be terribly excited about that. A lot of the scientists may be terribly excited about that, but if that were the extent of it, and there was some bacteria on distant planets somewhere, uh, that in and of itself is not going to be really earth-shaking. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we were to discover that, the, that there was actually on some other planets uh, plant life that was living plant life beyond just simple single cell bacteria, that would be more exciting. And it would have pot potentially a uh, different, uh, different impact on us. But still and all, some planets with some flowers on it, or plants, is not going to cause a, a major impact upon the daily lives of average people. Uh, but if we, in fact, took a next step and we discovered that there were some planets that actually had, for example, insect life, small bugs and insects and stuff on the planet. It would make us even more interested than just the plants on some other planet. And if we discovered that there were even higher forms of life on some other planet still elsewhere, that was like r small reptiles or a fish, a micro fish, or even small rodents, uh, we, we start to get more excited and start to have a bit more impact. But you can see why this is. It isn't because there's rodents on Rhodesia or somewhere on some planet. It's because it's starting to move toward human life. And, but uh, I would point out that, therefore, if we discovered that there were monkeys in, in high apes on some planet, we would start to get really excited. But not because we had found monkeys and apes but because we were starting to have a higher and higher probability projection that there's going to be people somewhere. You see, so you see, you see what's happening here is what we're really interested in while we're out there looking around for sentient life is we're out looking for life like us. Okay, but I want to propose something even more radical tonight. I want to propose that if in fact we found out that there was another planet where there was life like us, working, struggling, suffering, as uh, Nikola Tesla opined back in 1931, we still wouldn't be that happy. Because if they were just like us, if they're like other human beings, we wouldn't be that much more excited than if we discovered Russia, you know, or France. You know, there's more, okay, so there's more people like us. I mean, you're like, so what? You know, I mean, uh, I, I've actually felt disappointed some nights when I'm out walking our big dog and I look up at the stars and there they are and that whole kind of romantic feeling starts to come over me and I start to say to myself, wow, what if they're only like us? You know, worse yet, what if they're like Russians? You know, I mean, they, they could be, or French. You know, they could be, so, so what, what, what I'm saying is, is that, that uh, it, it's a lot of like, so what? You know, so, so Columbus discovered a whole, other, a whole other continent. And there was a whole bunch of people there, you know. And so everybody in Europe went, oh, great, I wonder if there's gold there. <laughs> you know, I mean, so, so, that, so what I'm suggesting is the radical idea that even if we did, in fact, find one or more planets 
where there were other beings that were basically just like us. And they weren't any more evolved than we are, spiritually, aren't any more evolved than we are intellectually, aren't any more evolved than we are emotionally, or very importantly, are no more evolved than we are spiritually and consciously, that we would be very disappointed. And so what we're really looking for to decide whether we're extremely interested in what's going on out there and that we really are intending to be impacted, have something earth-shaking take place, the entire mystery around the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the whole mystery surrounding the UFO phenomenon has to do with our supposition that there is a civilization out there that is more sentient than we are, more intelligent than we are, more spiritually evolved than we are, more technologically evolved than we are. And why then does that make us so excited? I would propose that it makes us that much more excited because what it really does is it, is it tells us, it confirms to us our suspicion that we are in the process of evolving. That we are in the process of evolving faculties that give us greater and greater access to discerning data about our environment. We are evolving faculties that enable us to, to transcend the lower angels of our human nature, that what we're looking for is confirmation of our higher selves and the prospect that we are on the right path. And I'm suggesting that that is, in fact, the role that religion has played historically in our human family that we have, in fact, not projected out into photoplasmic material manifestation, gods running around on Olympus, or angels dancing on heads of pins. What we have been doing as a human family is we have been attempting to discern what we believe to be the higher angels of our nature and projecting them out onto mythical beings. And the problem is that rather than seeing them as full-blown manifestations of the higher angels of our own nature and using them to motivate ourselves to, to move toward that type of evolution, what we've done is we've dropped back and worshipped them as something other than ourselves, something categorically distinct from ourselves and that we have then gotten into trying to get them to tell us what to do. Rather than coming to understand that the task at hand is for us to be able to develop these type of faculties and to be able to discern for ourselves what it is that we're supposed to do. What type of conduct, both collective or individual, is actually harmonious with the natural order of being in the universe. This is the task at hand for our human family. And we are looking for allies in that quest. We are seeking other beings who may have already succeeded in that teleological progression of actually surviving to the point where they have evolved the higher angels of their nature. Uh, and so I'm suggesting that that is what we are engaged in doing. And that the compromise that the Catholic Church is engaged in at the present time of scrambling around trying to say, oh, look at on third thought, uh, maybe there are beings in other planets, on other planets, and other star systems. Let's get with it. Let's get organized to figure out what this is all about. 
But while they're doing that, what's going on inside the Catholic Church, for example, is there is a radical reevaluation going on inside the Catholic Church that is represented, for example, by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin is a Jesuit priest who, in fact, you know, had the audacity to suggest that Jesus of Nazareth was a biological mutation. That he actually had this faculty of discernment, of unitive consciousness, fully evolved. And like other biological mutations, if it manifests before its proper time, it is destroyed by its environment, which is not yet ready to accommodate this biological change. And that what he is suggesting is that Jesus of Nazareth and others like the Buddha, others like Lao Tzu, other prophets in the Hindu tradition and others are mutations, that there is a thing happening in the human family that is, is lifting up and man, bringing into full manifestation a new faculty that we have by means of which we are able to directly and experientially link into a unified field, which actually is, we, we function in a sense just like a, uh, a radio crystal or a crystal radio set that we are able to directly link into a, an electromagnetic field phenomenon that has a particular frequency, a particular you know, a, a, a rate of frequency, an oscillation, that like sound has a particular frequency, like light has a particular vibrational frequency. What we have done as, as life on our planet is we have evolved in a tractor force manner we have evolved faculties which are able to directly and experientially encounter that particular electromagnetic frequency. And we don't think about it. We don't reflect upon it. What we do is we experience it. That's what distinguishes a faculty. That it just directly experiences it. And that that type of direct experience is what has been talked about down through the years, over the last 5,000 years, as this listening to the voice of God, of being able to directly discern the harmony of the universe, and to be able to intuitively know what type of conduct is either harmonious or disharmonious with that type of unitive insight. And that these beings that are manifesting this faculty have, have occurred in different parts of the world at different times. And people are in awe of them, and they begin to gather around them and ask them questions. And these beings simply, you know, be a lot of the time. They simply be. In fact, the energy field that is around their bodies actually is so intense that some people can actually see light around them, or what appears to be light, that there is an energy field around them that appears to function as, a, as the intermediary between this, this electromagnetic field that bonds every unit of matter in the universe together into a whole, and their, their internal sensory systems. And that this is the faculty which Crane Brinton believes is the faculty that is evolving in us teleologically and that will in fact when it comes into full manifestation distinguish us as the next evolutionary step in our biological evolution. And so what we're looking at and we're looking for in the universe is other beings that have been generated by the natural forces of our universe and they have been generated and they have risen up and they are moving teleologically toward a fuller and fuller manifestation with more and more of these faculties 
And so that the reason that we're so fascinated with these ETs is not because they're going to be just like us, not just because they're struggling and in, uh, in, in working every day and, and coming to no greater insights than those that we've come to. I mean, how exciting is that going to be? We're looking for something more. We're anticipating something more from these beings. And those, that is the, I'm suggesting, is the actual driver for the emotion, for the kind of romantic uh, mysterium uh, et tremendum that surrounds the quest for extraterrestrial intelligence, that surrounds the UFO phenomenon. So that when we see these extraordinarily interesting things happening with the UFO vehicles, like manifesting and unmanifesting and, and traveling uh, faster than anything we've ever seen and turning a 90 degree angle and all these kind of things, we go, oh boy, there it is. There it is, look. They have, there are beings around that have figured this stuff out. And so we get really excited, okay? And so I'm, I'm suggesting that that is what is surrounding the excitement about our movement. Uh, and I am suggesting that this is something that we ought to be conscious about and that we ought to then look back to our own particular religious traditions and understand that this kind of intuitive understanding that our human family has of the importance of this evolutionary process and of the special nature of some of these beings that has been hijacked by crasser beings who surround those people and, and try to lay claim to their specialness and have set up institutions and then try to, in fact, govern other people uh, by dint of the authority of these kind of special beings you know, we should not allow our desire to jettison that particular bathwater to stop us from recognizing the true baby that is our human family and what it is that is going on here. And so I would suggest that the, the implication, uh, the, the pro most profound implications with regard to our search for extraterrestrial intelligence are in fact evolutionary, as distinct from simply psychological or military or political or economic, that they are evolutionary. And, and that, that, that is what is, is going on. And uh, what we may be encountering with these UFO experiences and these direct uh, contacts of the fourth kind is we may well be encountering what is in a sense our selves in the future, but not in the more prosaic way that some people talk about it. Well, maybe these are all human beings that have you know, gone off the planet and uh, gone into uh, space and then come back and trying to warn us about ourselves and uh, they've, they've learned how to time travel and they've, that we've come back to warn ourselves not to you know, make atom bombs or have nuclear power plants, et cetera. That, but what it is, is, is something similar to that, but more subtle. Because the, the same process of evolution that, that we experience ourselves going through is going on throughout the universe. And so that what we may be encountering is simply a further manifestation of this exact natural process that has come to fruition on other star systems who have in fact learned to travel faster than the speed of light and co have come to visit. So I'm suggesting that that is the, the more radical implication of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and that uh, therefore uh, I'm proposing that that is what we are all really engaged in if we think about it a little more profoundly. So there is a, those are my uh, initial observations to attempt to uh, stimulate uh, conversation uh, among us. Uh, but I, I do want to point out before we get to 
questions and answers, etc. Well, I would, would like to suggest that this does not answer certain ultimate questions. That is, for example, whether or not out beyond the confines of the material universe, which is made up of the sum total of these units of, of uh, inchoate quantum fields, a finite number of these units, whether they're contracting and expanding or expanding into no nothingness, that there still remains the question of whether or not out beyond the physical boundaries of our physical universe, there abides an infinite and eternal sea of entirely undifferentiated consciousness, which in fact enfolded into being the actual material universe. And that each and every one of these inchoate quantum fields is in fact simply a condensed form of consciousness. That's the theological question. So those are my thoughts. Uh, I'm, uh, thank you for uh, putting up with me uh, in that regard. Sure. This this right was right at nine o'clock. I figured just we get to nine and <laughs> okay. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to take a fifteen-minute break and uh, then return, and we'll have our uh, raffle and uh, drawings for prizes. Is because that there, if if anybody asks any of the more technical questions about, you know, uh, what kind of different worldviews are there, it's a lot less interesting than I think the subject that we have in front of us now. Uh, but it just I, I got them to, to bring that in case anybody asks them the technical questions about how many different distinct worldviews are there, what are the implications of each worldview with regard to the UFO issue, et cetera. Uh, but uh, don't, don't worry about that. If, if people don't want to get into that, we don't have to do that. Okay, so I, I just wanted to, I wanted to give, give us a chance to talk about this because, you know, it's a, you know, we're used to kind of having people sit there and tell you what they think about the whole thing, but what's really important is what you guys think about this stuff, you know? I mean, I've been, I've been at this now, I guess the first, first time that I actually got uh, involved in this, I guess it was back in 1977, 1977, uh, right, right after uh, Carter got elected, that uh, Jimmy Carter, right after he was elected in uh, November of 19, uh, 76, he called in the Central Intelligence Agency director and asked him to, uh, prior to his, prior to Carter being sworn in in January of 1977, he asked the CIA director whether he would give him access to the UFO information and the CIA director uh, refused to do it. Uh, that was uh, George, George Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush. Uh, and, uh, and so, so what Carter did is he, he contacted the library, he contacted actually the Congress and the House uh, Science and Technology Committee has the authority to ask for certain type of scientific information to be declassified. And so they, they submitted a request for the declassification of information about the UFO issue uh, and the, the team that was assigned to monitor all of this was the Science and Technology Division of the Library of Congress. And so I ended up getting contacted by, the, by Marcia Smith, who was the head of the Science and Technology Division, uh, in my capacity as Chief Counsel for the Jesuit National Headquarters. She wanted to know whether we would be able to uh, assist the President in getting access to the Vatican Library and getting access to any of the information that the Vatican Library might have about extraterrestrial intelligence or the UFO phenomenon. Uh, and that's how, I first, that's how I first got involved in this. And, uh, and then I was later asked to go and deliver a three-hour seminar to the uh, top SETI 
officials at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And so I did a, uh, I did a presentation to them on the theological implications of the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And so, so those were the, some of the earlier things that I became involved in over the years and that, uh, and that I, began to, I began to apply some of the scholastic training that I had had uh, not only legally but in foreign policy and uh, American government and other places and in comparative social ethics to try to assist in participate in the UFO community uh, because a lot of lawyers are afraid to get involved in it. They, they think it, it threatens their credibility, uh, you know, in that uh, in, in scholars are afraid to get involved in it. Uh, so I, I wanted to try to, you know, I know if I'm only going to get one life, though I imagine there's probably strong arguments that you get more than one, uh, but if you're only going to get one life, you've got to pay attention to this subject, you know. I mean, it, I mean, if all of a sudden you get to the end and discover you only get one life and you go, oh, trap, you know, I always wanted to get to that, you know, I always wanted to get a little deeper into that, so. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. The, the, uh, the one, one of the things you learn in Washington, D.C., and I was in Washington for about 20 years, uh, is that, that Washington doesn't function like you're taught uh, in high school civics and in college. Uh, it's, it doesn't function that way. Uh, it, it takes a while to kind of figure out how, how it really does function. And uh, the bureaucracies that function in Washington, D.C., where people are there for, you know, 20, 30 years, and uh, every four to eight years, a whole new administration comes in and then leaves, and then new ones come in and then leave. And, uh, and so a lot of the bureaucracies just basically hold on to the woodwork. And no matter what the, what the new administration asks for or tells them to do, uh, or has a mandate from the electorate to get done, uh, the bureaucracy just dig in their heels and, and won't do it. Uh, and so then the question arises, what is the president going to do about that? Uh, and if he starts firing people, then, you know, then they sue him, and, uh, you know, and there's all kinds of stuff going on. So they're, they're constantly trying to figure out. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. It was, I, was out, I, was <laughs> I was out in Iowa back in 2008, I happened to uh, have run the primary in a quarter of the state of Iowa for John Edwards back before we knew. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 John, and John was in fact, was in fact the most progressive uh, of the Democratic candidates that were actually out there campaigning. And uh, uh, as, we, as we waged our way into the campaign, uh, I ended up going to meet with uh, Barack Obama <coughs> and had three meetings with him actually. The first meeting I was talking to him about the, uh, the probabilities that either John Edwards was going to be the nominee and that uh, Obama was going to be the vice president uh, or Obama might get the nomination and, uh, and uh, John would be his vice president. And I said that, uh, you know, this, there, there's a certain number of areas that you have policy positions on that are just terrible. And, uh, you know, like this private nuclear power, for example. You know, I know you, I know you, you, you come from uh, Illinois, and they've got 11 nuclear power plants uh, in Illinois. And I know that the company that owns them is the fourth largest contributor to your senatorial campaign. <laughs> I know all that. But, you, but you're not running for the, the Senate again. You know, you're running for the presidency and the, the, the National Democratic Party. I said, you know, this is the fifth major campaign that I've been involved in. And that, let me tell you, the, you know, that as chief counsel in the Karen Silkwood case, uh, that won the largest civil judgment in the entire history of the United States uh, against, uh, and in this case, against the private nuclear industry, and as chief counsel at Three Mile Island that stopped them from pumping all the radioactive effluents from that damaged nuclear facility into the Susquehanna River 
which is what they were going to be doing, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had authorized them to do it. I said, you know, I know what the dangers of this private nuclear industry are, and that not only are they not able to build a safe nuclear reactor, but they're not able to dispose of the, the waste materials. And so he, he looked around, I guess there were several people in the room, and he looked at me and he said, look, he says, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. And he reached out and he put his hand on my arm, very kind of intimately, and he said, look, let, let me tell you what I'll do. He says, uh, I will give you my personal word that I will not personally authorize the building, uh, the licensing or the building of a single nuclear power plant until I am personally convinced that it can be operated safely and that the, the materials that it generates can be disposed of safely. And I looked, him, I looked at him and I said, well, neither one of those two things is ever going to happen. And he looked around and he said, well, then neither you nor I have anything to worry about, do we? That's what he said. And so, so I, I said to him, I said, that was very good. That was really very good. I said, but it doesn't really answer the question as to what percentage of the alternative energy budget you're going to squander by giving it to primarily the major petroleum corporations for them to try to build a safe nuclear reactor or to find a way of disposing of more nuclear waste. I said, I, so it doesn't answer what percentage of it you're going to squander. And he looked at me and said, what percentage do you have in mind? <laughs> and I said, I don't have any percentage in mind. He said, call me when you do. <laughs> OK? So, 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 so that, that gives you some idea of, of the lack of principle that kind of obtains uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, and, and Bob Fink one time said to me, Bob Fink was the chief investigator for Bella Abzug, for those of you who remember Bella. Bella was the congresswoman from New York that used to wear these big 50-gallon you know, hats and, and, uh, and was just a tough, uh, tough hombre. And uh, she chaired the House Subcommittee on Individual Rights of the House Judiciary Committee. And uh, she seconded Bob Fink over to the, the, the church committee investigation when they were investigating the intelligence abuses, actually to the Pike Committee, which was the House committee that was the mirror committee to the church committee in the Senate. Anyway, and so he knew all about this kind of stuff. And I was explaining to him how we had uncovered the evidence that the Central Intelligence Agency was smuggling heroin from uh, Southeast Asia on Central Intelligence Agency planes and flying it out of there and that they were getting a cut of the profits uh, from Vang Pao, who was the major opium warlord in, in Laos. And, uh, and he just smiled at me and he said, Dan, look, anybody who's so ignorant that they don't know that the CIA was smuggling heroin out of, the, out of Southeast Asia to fund covert operations uh, is too ignorant to function in Washington. He said, but anybody who is so naive as to try to tell the American people about that is too naive to succeed in Washington. Okay. So there's a couple stories about how it really functions inside there. Uh, the, right, right behind you, Bob, and then I'll, Bob, the, the other fellow raised. Yes? Um, can you explain to us or, or share with us some of the stories about uh, the officials, like some of the stories that they were claiming mm. that they saw? Oh, yeah. That when, when I was general counsel for the, uh, the uh, disclosure project back in 2001, that Dr. Stephen Greer put together, uh, I was the one who vetted uh, the witnesses to determine which witnesses we were going to put out in front of the uh, American public at the uh, National uh, Press Gallery and, uh, and bring to their senators and congresspeople. And so I, I interviewed a lot of these people and, and ended up figuring out who the 20 of them were going to be. That, that One of them, for example, was the uh, chief investigator for the Federal Aviation Agency. And he said that uh, they had, uh, they had uh, monitored, in the Federal Aviation Agency, they had monitored a UFO following a Japanese commercial airliner uh, flying in from the Pacific uh, up over Alaska and down into Washington State, and that they had monitored it, uh, they had photographs of it from the plane, they had radar, uh, tapes of the radar uh, sightings of this, of this UFO, uh, and that they had them at the FAA. And he was preparing a report about this thing, saying that this was extraordinary because we had not only visual sightings and photographs, but we had uh, proven radar tracks on these things. And he said that, uh, that two men from the Central Intelligence Agency came uh, and insisted that he turn over uh, all of these to them. And that uh, he said they didn't have any authority to, to do that. 
And uh, he told them that uh, they would have to come back with an authorization from the president. And uh, they left, and so uh, this fellow made copies of the radar and the photographs and stuff, and, uh, and got all the names of the people that had, I, I witnessed this thing. And then these two guys came back and said they didn't need authorization from the president, that the director of the agency had said to turn this stuff over, uh, or else he would be considered a threat to the national security of the country. And so they turned over all the originals, and he kept the copies. And so he had them all this time until he retired, and that he wanted to know what to do with them. So I interviewed him, and I said, well, what you do is you get up in front of the national television, and you tell them. <laughs> and then we'll take you to your United States senator, and you tell him. And then I'll bring you to your congressman, and you tell him too. Okay? And, uh, and then, there was, then there were the, the colonel uh, and the uh, captain, whom, whom you heard about, uh, Andrus, or, uh, and, and Bob, their names are, that were the colonel and captain in charge of the uh, Nike uh, Zeus missile site uh, up in Montana back in, I think, 1964, uh, when a, a major, well, uh, Bob was telling about it first, the, the captain, he was, down, he was down in the silo where this big m missile site was. And uh, he gets this frantic call from up above from one of the uh, armed guards that were up on upstairs, up outside. And they, the guy was frantic. And he said that there's a huge, like, UFO, uh, that it's all glowing and it's sitting right off outside the, uh, the parameters there uh, where the fences are. And, uh, and so Bob said to him, well, uh, has it come in? Has it crossed the fence yet? You know, like as if that was the news story. Uh, and he said, no, no, not yet. He says, well, you're armed, aren't you? And he said, yes, yes, I've got my M16. He says, well, then secure the perimeter, he says to him, right? And so like about four or five minutes later, the guy calls back again, and he's in hysterics. And he said, I've got injured men up here. You know, two of the men tried to climb over the razor wire from inside to get out of the, to get out of the facility because this thing had come right up over the whole facility. And he said he was just turning to go wake up the major, who was, it says 2 o'clock in the morning, right? And he, and he was getting ready to wake up the major that was taking a sleep break when all of a sudden uh, all 24 of the, of the Nike Zeus missiles went offline. And uh, every single one of them is completely independently wired. And yet all 24 of them went completely offline. And so... So Bob gets on the phone and he calls the colonel who was in charge of the uh, a battery of these things. There were like three of these sites right together and, uh, and told him what had happened. And so the colonel uh, gets on the phone to NORAD and uh, he calls NORAD and he said, uh, we've got a situation here. He said that, our, uh, that all, all 24 of our uh, Nike, uh, Nike Zeus missiles have gone offline here. And the guy, the guy at the other end of NORAD said, are you wanting to report a UFO incident? And he said, and Bob, uh, he, he, or the, the colonel told me this. Uh, he said, you know, uh, it was the longest three seconds of my life. He said, and I said to him, absolutely, I do. And the guy said, well, that's interesting because the site, you know, 20 miles to your east and 20 miles to your west have both reported UFO incidents and that all of their Nike Zeus missiles are offline as well. Okay, and so he filed an official report about this. He was never contacted. No one ever asked him about it. Uh, no one ever interviewed him about it or anything. And he was just flabbergasted yeah. that, that something like that could have happened and that they, they would have not done anything about it. And so he, so uh, I, I interviewed him and I had him uh, testify uh, in, at the National Press Club. I had him make his presentation. And then I took him over to meet with his congressman, okay, uh, from Ohio. I had him come and meet his congressman. So we go into the meeting with this congressman. We sit down, and he tells the whole story to his congressman. The congressman says, look, I want to make it clear that I believe you. I believe you. But you have to be very, very careful about this subject. He said, there are a number of us here on the Hill who take this all very seriously but there aren't enough of us. And uh, this would destroy uh, our political career if we went public with this, that they would turn on us and they would, they would destroy us politically. 
He said, but I want you to be assured that I believe what you're saying. I take it very seriously. And I will talk about this with my other colleagues here who, who take this seriously. And we turned and walked out of his office. And I remember uh, uh, and we, we were coming out of the congressional office building uh, in uh, the Rayburn uh, building. And we stood on the steps. And he, he's standing here on my left. And we look across the, the road. And here's the United States Capitol building right next to where the house offices are. And he looks over at the Capitol building like this. And this is, this is a full bird colonel in the Air Force. And he starts to cry. And he said, you know, I always dreamed for like 20 years, I dreamed that this day would come when I would get to come and tell my congressman about this. But of course, nobody did anything. Nobody did anything. And, uh, and, it, and it reminded me of the, the, the story when, when we found out about all the Iran-Contra stuff and uh, that I went to, uh, to meet with one of the fellows who was the, uh, he was the guy who worked for the House Judiciary Committee. He's the guy who actually interviewed the uh, uh, Alexander Butterfield who told him about the existence of the, wire, the uh, recording system in Nixon's uh, Oval Office. And uh, this fellow that I went to talk to, I laid out all the stuff we had about Iran-Contra. And he said, this is remarkable. This is fantastic. Like, I'm going to have to confirm this. Uh, and he did. He went and talked to Cy Hirsch and some other people that confirmed what we were saying was true. And he said, I'm going to go talk to Peter Rodino. I'm going to go talk to Peter Rodino. He's the chairman of the Judiciary Committee still. They're the ones that are in charge of doing impeachment resolutions and this information that you're revealing about the cocaine smuggling, the weapon smuggling in violation of the, the uh, uh, Boland Amendment and all that are clearly impeachable offenses for, for Reagan and Bush and Ed Meese and uh, others. He said, and so I'm going to go tell, I'm going to go tell uh, uh, Peter Rodino about this and he'll put together a special uh, task force uh, which I'll head up uh, and we'll get these guys impeached. So he leaves. <laughs> And I'm waiting two days, three days. I don't hear anything from him. So I call over to the National Security Archives where he was. And, uh, and I talk to Tom Blanton, who's his deputy. And I say, Tom, what's the story? I haven't heard anything back. And he says, look, come on over here and let's talk. So I come over there. And he reports to me that the fellow that I was talking to had gone to talk to Peter Rodino. And Rodino had said to him, he said, after he related to him all the stuff that was going on, the cocaine smuggling, the assassination program, the, all the illegal weapons shipments and stuff, including the sale of tow missiles to uh, the Hezbollah. <laughs> you know, uh, we tell him all this stuff, and he, said, he tells all this to Peter Rodino, and Peter Rodino, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee that has constitutional responsibility for impeachment resolutions, he turns to this fellow and he says, my God, this is horrible. He said, why, he said, he said, I've been for years, I've been telling uh, my constituents and stuff. I said, that, look, if you don't like the way that the American government is being run, you ought to write a letter to your congressman. <laughs> and he said, uh, and he said, and if the congressman doesn't do what you want them to do, you ought to vote for somebody else for your congressman. He said, but if what you're telling me is true, why then, why then we haven't even been in charge. I'm not going to allow the Congress of the United States to investigate anything like that, he says to him. <laughs> so that, that's the reality. Yeah, did Bob and then Barbara. Uh, <clears throat> yes, this may be a less political question. <laughs> but I hope so. <laughs> right. it's, it's pretty clear that the uh, apparent hybridization program is is focused on improving the race. And my question is, do you think that the, uh, uh, the plan is to improve their race with some of our skills, such as appreciation of music and sense of humor, or do you think <laughs> the plan is to improve our race with their skills of tele telepathic communication? Actually, I, I, can, I, can tell you, I can tell you, based on all of the people that I've talked about, or talked to about this thing, what my opinion is. And that is, is that neither one of those is true. That what they're doing is they're trying to develop a hybrid race uh, or species that can live on a, a, a separate planet somewhere. They're, they're attempting to retain 
valuable DNA and qualities of our human family in case we destroy ourselves. Because the, this issue of thermonuclear weapons is, is still very real. And the, uh, the nuclear power plants, have these, each one of these 103 nuclear power plants in the United States has massive amounts of radioactive waste materials that are all stored right on their own facility. And in a number of them, for example, San Onofre and Diablo Canyon you know, are right on earthquake zones, uh, earthquake faults. You know, and with the, the inevitable global warming and rising of the, the, the sea levels, you know, there are numerous uh, nuclear power plants that will be underwater. You know, like the Fukuyama just got hit with a wave and then it receded. Like, but if they go completely underwater, I mean, that, that, that is going to completely contaminate the ocean waters. Kill off all the plankton at the, uh, you know, at the, the top of the food chain and then the food chain dies all the way on down. Uh, you know, and the, with, the, with the melting of the polar ice caps, which we hear reports on every single day, uh, you know, the, 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 the desalinization uh, of the salt water in the ocean through the melting of the polar ice caps reduces the salinization levels of the sea, and, the, and the, therefore the density of the sea decreases, and therefore the underwater currents start rising to the surface and dissipating. And it destroys the entire temperate zone on the planet which is dependent upon the flow of these underwater currents and stuff. I mean, the, the people know this, and yet they keep right on doing it, you know? And it's all, all of them, Republican and Democrat alike, those, those are no serious distinctions. And so the, there, there's, a, a, in, in my opinion, there is a longer range program going on here to salvage uh, some of the, the DNA uh, and stuff of our human family and to prepare another planet where, where uh, these hybrid people can go and, uh, and be a new, a new species. Barbara? Yeah, well, several minutes ago you um, mentioned, you know, talking to, I think you were saying you were talking to one of the congressmen. And yeah. you said we can't bring up this information yeah. or they will the come and get us. Yeah, that was Dennis Kucinich. So who, do you have any idea who are the they who will come? Oh, oh, the, 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 <laughs> yeah, the they, uh, I do, I do, I have a very specific, uh, specific opinion about the they, uh, the, it's, it's complex, uh, it's, it's gone on over a period of time, uh, but, but there, there's, there's so much that people don't know about what's really gone on, that, uh, you know, for, for example, uh, I mean, I would guess there's probably not maybe three people in the room here, and this is a fairly sophisticated community here, that realized that back in 1934, uh, there was an actual military coup that was undertaken against uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. That uh, it was planned carefully, the DuPonts were involved in it, uh, uh, the, the, the same people that organized the Foreign Military Expeditionary Force that was sent down into Nicaragua to overthrow the democratic government in Nicaragua were all involved in it. George Herbert Walker, for example. Uh, the, the, the George Herbert Walker of George Herbert Walker Bush fame, you know, the grandfather, uh, who was the chairman of the board of Brown Brothers Investment Corporation that, uh, uh, in that, you know, that they were represented, it's a long story, but they were represented, Brown Brothers, uh, formed Brown Brothers Harriman, and, uh, and George Herbert Walker uh, retired from being the CEO of Brown Brothers, went on and established a major bank in New York City with a branch in the Netherlands, which became the primary source of funding for Adolf Hitler <coughs> and the rise of uh, the fascist state in Germany uh, as the bulwark against Bolshevism in Europe. You know, and that there were all kinds of people that involved in putting their money into that bank to have it go to them. Uh, that involved the DuPonts, involved the uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, involved uh, the, uh, you know, Henry Luce, you know, and uh, all, all that crowd of people. And they have always, they have always uh, disagreed with the basic thesis of the American Constitution that somehow the regular people are authorized to govern ourselves. They've never agreed with that. They've always thought, in a kind of a more European sense, that there was an, an aristocracy that uh, really uh, was authorized to govern 
uh, they, they are the rulers of the realm, these people. And they have, they have, they have progeny, they've gone down through the years, uh, and that they, they were very, very prominent uh, prior to World War uh, II. Uh, I mean, you, we need to remember that, like, following World War I, you know, in, in 1917, between 1917 and 1920, there was a major commission set up uh, in the Middle East after World War I, chaired by Winston Churchill, who was, the, who was the Secretary for Colonial Affairs of England. And they had a commission of 22 people, 20, 21 men and one woman, that actually sat down and drew the boundaries for the countries of the Middle East and, and created you know, Lebanon and, and Saudi Arabia and, and decided who the royal families would be that would govern each one of those places. So this whole big you know, Arab Spring that we've heard about here over the last uh, year and 18 months, you know, almost all of those leaders that got put in are the direct descendants of the ones that were put in by the Western Allied powers. You know, go governing those areas, and so that you know that uh, people people come to the UFO issue and they go, oh, there's a group, there's a group that is sort of in charge of kind of a secret uh, cabal. Uh, I mean, th they've been right in front of you, you know, for decades, uh, doing this kind of stuff, and so that this you know when when you have George Herbert Walker being one of the, the principal funders of Adolf Hitler and uh, in, in running coups against uh, Nicaragua and running coups in the, in the Middle East. You know, they're the ones that sent the foreign military expeditionary force into the Soviet Union uh, back in 1917, in November, after the October Revolution. They actually organized a foreign military expeditionary force and sent it into Russia to try to overthrow the Bolshevik government. You know, and the, so I mean, in the and yet you don't learn about this stuff in high school civics. You don't learn about it even in college. And so, so that what I'm saying is that there's a there is there has been a they uh, that have been uh, in charge of policy in the United States and in Western uh, Western governments for uh, for decades. And so as, as to who they are at any given moment. You know, uh, there, there tend to be bloodlines, basically. You know, I mean, when you get George Herbert Walker Bush becoming the President of the United States, and then George Walker Bush becoming President of the United States, you know, the, the, uh, the grandson and great-grandson of George Herbert Walker, you know, and that the, when, when George Herbert Walker was the principal funder of, of Hitler between 1924 and 1934, one of the other major supporters of Adolf Hitler was uh, uh, Abdul Aziz, mm -hmm. who was the, the, the primate of Saudi Arabia that was chosen by, by Winston Churchill to be that because he was furious uh, about, the, uh, about the resolution at the end of World War I that there was going to be a Jewish state in, the, in Palestine. Uh, the, so that, that they were furious. And so that they, they assisted uh, Germany in trying to stomp out the Jews, you know, and, and this this stuff is this is not uh, you know David Icke's stuff, you know of you know reptiles eating your butt, you know, and that stuff, you know. I mean, this these are these are people who get up and put their pants on one leg at a time, you know, and you can know who they are and track them around, but people don't do it. So so the, there there is a there is a they uh, that participate in this this type of thing. And there are any number of solid history books where you can find out about it. It's just that they don't teach them in college and in, in, uh, in, in high schools. Hitler had a sign. He used to do this. And yeah. then I had the backing of millions. Fits right in with what you said about. Yeah. No, I know. They were back again. I know. Yes, when he threatened to, uh, when he threatened to kill uh, the Brits at Dunkirk. They said, "No, you let them go, or we're taking the money away. Mm -hmm. You might let them go." Mm -hmm. No, that's a. Just a quick question. Yes. I have to make an assumption about you, but my assumption is that early on in your career, you were either a true skeptic, a true believer, or just curious. My question is, if you were a true skeptic at one point, did you ever become a true believer, and what are the circumstances behind that? I've always been a true believer. 
a true believer. I was, I've never been a skeptic. You know, because I didn't believe the bullshit to begin with. So I didn't start going, oh, gee, what a surprise. You know, that, so uh, uh, that what, what it was is that, that I, I guess that there's a pattern that happened here. That when my, my, my father had been uh, seriously injured, he was a World War II veteran. He was injured in the uh, Battle of Salerno, uh, actually right after the Battle of Salerno. And, uh, and he came back he came back home early from the war and so i was born right i, I was actually born three days after uh before franklin roosevelt died I, i'm i'm actually one of the youngest people you'll ever meet who was alive while roosevelt was president you know so so i that i i my father was totally destroyed by the war became a complete alcoholic you know shell shock and battle fatigue and all the other aphorisms they used to refer to. But the, the bottom line is, is that because of that, he became a total alcoholic. And my mother and father separated when I was 12 years old. And uh, I got sent to live with an aunt and uncle. Uh, and they, they, were, uh, they lived in this beautiful little town up in northern New York, up by Lake George, New York. Total pastoral setting. You know, I got to do absolutely everything in the world. You know, I, I graduated in a class of only 49 people, right? And so, so I got to be the president of the student council for three years. I got to be in all the school plays. I got to be the captain of all three football, all the football teams. And I got to do every, all that stuff. So I, I, believed, I believed that uh, everything was great. And uh, I believed that and I learned about the Constitution. And I said, this is a great idea about people all governing ourselves. That's a terrific idea. And when I got up to uh, being in college, and I, for example, I was taking a foreign policy from Henry Kissinger and, uh, and, uh, at Harvard College, and he started saying, this is how the world really is, and I just said, no way. You know, that, that doesn't have to be so at all. You know, and so I just stayed right at it, and I continued to insist that the, all of the ideals that we had been taught uh, were true. And it, just a brief side that I guess the, the best example of this is, it's a little bit sidebar, but, but uh, Antigone, if you've ever heard of the story of Antigone, it's an ancient Greek story that Sophocles wrote the original Antigone. And Antigone was one of the, one of the, uh, the daughters of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the king. And uh, they, had twin, they had twin sons. It was, there was uh, Antigone, Electra, and the two sons, the two twin sons. And the bottom line is uh, elect that uh, Antigone was fated by the Delphic Oracle, that when she was born, they did this prophecy that she would die at the hands of her own family for attempting to defend the honor of her brother. And uh, nothing seemed like that could possibly happen. She grew up to young adulthood, and her brothers were fine and wonderful. And what happened is that the, uh, because the two twin brothers... Uh, were born when uh, when uh, uh, Oedipus no that when when the king who was it, put his eyes out with the with the brooches and ran out into the storm and all that stuff anyway the 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 two brothers were not yet eighteen years old and so they weren't old enough to rule so their uncle Creon their paternal uncle was the guardian until they became of age of eighteen and the 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 decision was that because they were twins that the one that was born first would rule for a year, and then he would stand down. And then the one that was born second of the twins would rule for a year, and then he would stand down, and they would do this. Well, what happened, obviously, when they got to be 18, the first brother that was born first became king. When it got to the end of the year, he didn't think it was such a good idea. <laughs> right? And so he insisted upon staying in charge. And so the younger brother went to the city fathers and said, what's the story here? We had a clear agreement. That, uh, that I was good, and they said, well, you know, uh, the tradition is, you know, that the, actually it is the eldest son is the one that gets to be king, and he was older than you by a whole minute. And uh, they went through this whole routine, and they, they told him to kiss off, you know. So he got really upset, and he went out, and he organized all the peasants, and then and the barbarians outside of the, city, the gates of the city of Thebes, and he led them in an attack against the city of Thebes. And the two twin brothers met in, in personal combat out in front of the seventh gate of Thebes, and they slew each other. And so in Sophocles' tale, what happens is they take the, they take the, the brother, the older brother who had died defending the city of Thebes 
against his younger brother. And they march him around the city on the big golden shield. And they put the coins in his eyes. And he crosses the river Styx. And, and Creon, the, the uncle, declares that the, the younger brother has to be left out for carrion out in front of the gates of thieves so that the wild animals would eat him and he would and anybody who tried to put coins in his eyes or uh, coins in his mouth would be executed as an enemy of the state and so in sophocles and antigone antigone goes oh shit you know here it is you know uh here they're telling me we can't do it I'll go. so she goes out in broad daylight and she puts the gold coins in his eyes and stuff like this and so they have to arrest her and kill her Right? And everybody's dead all over the stage and everything at the end, you know, like in the Greek tragedies. Well, in, in, 19, in 1954, Jean Anouilly, the French existentialist, wrote a second version of Antigone, which is the point of my story. And, uh, and he wrote the, the whole thing, everything happens just exactly the same, except they all get to that point. And then there, and there's this famous scene where Antigone is deciding she's going to go out and put the gold coins in the eyes of her brother and bury them with some dirt. And she's, she's there, and she's, ah, oh, this is that fate from the Delphic Oracle. She says, then, then I'm going to be executed, and it's going to be terrible. Nah, I don't think I'm going to do that. She said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait until it's dark, <laughs> and I'll just wait here, and uh, I'll wait for these guards to go to sleep. And she waits the first night, they don't go to sleep. She waits the second night, they don't go to sleep. Finally, the third night, they fall asleep. So she goes on out there, and she puts the gold coins in his eyes, and she tosses dirt on him like that. And she comes back, and she goes to bed. She gets up the next morning, waiting for this big hullabaloo to take place, right? Well, it turns out that the guards wake up in the night, and they go, oh, nuts, look at somebody's kicked dirt on this dude. And they put these gold coins in his eyes, and somebody said, we better go tell Creon. So they run up, and they go tell Creon. There's this great big famous scene in John and Louis Singh with the moonlight shining in the bedroom, and he's, and he's saying, oh, the, the, somebody's buried him, and he's put the coins in his eyes. He's going to cross the river Styx. And so Creon looks at me and says, look, did anybody see this? <laughs> and he said, no, no, nobody saw it. Said, well, then go out, go out and unbury him and take the coins and keep the coins yourself. And don't tell anybody about this, right? So they go, okay. And the next morning, you know, there's, there's Antigone waiting for this big explosion to take place, and nothing happens. And she goes out and looks, and there he is, all unburied, with no coins in his eyes and stuff. So she goes, oh, drat, I better do this again. <laughs> so she waits the next night, they don't fall asleep. The next night, they don't fall asleep. Finally, the third night, they fall asleep. She goes back out, puts the gold coins in, and kicks dirt on him, right? And they wake up and catch her. And they grab her, and she's got this hood on, and they drag her all the way up into the bedchambers of Creon. And the big moonlight is shining in, and they throw her into this place. Say, here's the culprit. We've caught the person. We have to execute the person. And he throws back her hood, and it's Antigone. He goes, oh, Antigone. You know, oh, what are you doing? You know, well, uh, this is crazy. I've told you that you can't do this. And she said, well, I've been fated by the Delphic Oracle. And he says, well, wait, stop this. Look at, did anybody see this happen? <laughs> And they say, no, nobody said, go out and put the, take the gold coins and keep them and put the dirt back on this dude, or off this dude. So now he's got, this, he's got Antigone in the room. He says, Antigone, look, I've got to talk with you about something here. It's like, there's no such thing as this Delphic Oracle stuff. You know, all this hoopla about you being fated by the Delphic Oracle, that, that, none, of, none of that's true at all. And she says, uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, she says, and I've got to go do this. I'm faded. I've got to go do this. He says, no, look, 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 wait a second, wait a second. There, there, there's something else. There's something else I've got to tell you. He says, uh, your two twin brothers, they had the fight out in front of the gates of Thebes. They cut each other up so badly that we couldn't really recognize who was who. And it turns out that we buried the wrong guy. That we actually, we actually took the guy, the younger brother, who led the attack against the city of Thebes. We put him on the gold shield and we put the coin, and he marched around the city. And so he, in fact, crossed the river Styx. And your older brother, who got all cut up and was laying out there, he died defending the city of Thebes. And so by all the mythology, he's going to cross the river Styx anyhow. So you don't have to do anything. And she went, no, no, no. She said, uh, I'm going to go and I'm going to bury him. And uh, I have to do this. And he said, look, okay, okay, Antigone. If you're going to go after a look at it, I've got to tell you, there are no gods. <laughs> You've got to get something here. There are no gods. Your dad and I and the other city fathers made these guys up. So there's none of that is true. And she said to him, oh, really? Watch. She said, I am going to go out in broad daylight tomorrow and put the coins in his eyes and bury him. And you're going to have to execute me. You're going to have to cement me into the cave, you know, with your son, who was my fiance. And you're going to be fated just like you were fated. Because it turns out that the gods are true. And you didn't even know it. 
That's the reality that we're talking about here. The fact of the matter is there's something very real going on in the evolution of our human family, in the evolution of our consciousness. And there's a natural law that functions in the universe. Okay? And all of these guys who've laid out all this stuff about natural law and how wonderful the Constitution is and all that kind of stuff, even though many of them didn't believe it, it turns out that it's true. And all of us who have had the opportunity to get educated at some of the best schools in the entire world have found out that you dig down deep enough and the best minds in the history of the world have all come to understand that this reality is true. And that we are evolving and we are able to intuitively discern this unitive phenomenon. And if we conduct ourselves in accordance with it, that we will prevail. That the winds, the winds of the future are at our backs. And all of these people who are conniving and lying and, 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 and hiding in darkness and doing heroin smuggling and assassinations, you know, they, they may well, you know, in, in the short term, you know, have advantage. But the reality is if we maintain faith and we maintain our positive vision and our belief in these ideals, we in fact will merit a place at the table you know, of the entire galactic civilization. Because this secret is known throughout the universe. And that we are on that side of history. And these people are our allies. And even if there are, in fact, other more primitive uh, species around in the universe that, in fact, are at lower levels of elevation, etc., of, of evolution, the fact of the matter is, we are part of the future. And that this quest that we have to reach out to the stars, that we have to reach out to these other beings out there. When we, when we pick out a star at night and we sit and watch it pulse and we reach out with our consciousness to share our consciousness with them, this is the communication that goes on throughout the universe and draws us up like a, like a light beam into the future. And these beings are on our side. And we, we have to have compassion. We have to have love for our, for our fellow human beings. We have to have love and affection for all of our fellow sentient beings throughout the universe and not allow ourselves to designate them as some ultimate other that we can kill or exercise violence against, etc. We have to organize and, and share our views with each other and with all of our sisters and brothers. And that is why one day... <coughs> One day, we will, in fact, rise to the, to the state that we are capable of, and we will sit at that table somewhere, you know, probably off this planet. At the beginning of your talk, you uh, went through a bunch of different scenarios about, okay, what is this UFO phenomenon, and so on and so forth. There is uh, one scenario that I wanted to ask you about. Mm -hmm. I came across somebody on the internet who said they thought it was demonic. Mm -hmm. And wanted to ask you about that. What do you think of it being a demonic thing? Yeah. I, I, think, I think that what, what, uh, what this is all about, this theory of demons, etc., is, is in fact an attempt to anthropomorphize, actually, kind of these kind of lower chakra energy systems that we have in our body. If you study the Hindu traditions, et cetera, you'll, you'll know that we have these energy centers in our body, that there are seven of them, uh, primary ones, et cetera. Uh, this has to do with the worldviews, that when I was talking about the kind of more scholastic uh, discussion of what these worldviews are all about. And, and the, the fact of the matter is, is that the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the energy system that is at the base of our spine, which is the, symbolized by the red energy of the, of the chakra, of the root chakra, is absolutely essential for the, for the fullness of life, for the, the, the generation and the maintenance and the adherence to life, the will to live in an incarnated uh, capacity. This is a long and deep theological issue because the, the Manichaeus, of course, assumed that the entire state of incarnated being is fallen and sinful 
and that any sexual activity, any kind of uh, self assertion is, is completely uh, wrong. And so that they, what they've done is they have, they, have, uh, they have characterized that type of energy. And so what they've done is they have projected it out into a, into a, a, a type of drive on the part of an individual that is selfish and uh, acquisitive and dominating and a whole series of other things that in fact are true. But it's only one of seven different energy centers that we have. And if it, in, in fact, is properly balanced with a healthy exercise of the other energy centers in our body, it, in fact, is relegated to the role of preserving life and preserving your life uh, in extremis. Uh, and and it's, it's not, in fact, a fallen state. Now, this, this harkens all the way back to the ultimate question that I reserved at the very end of the talk at the beginning about whether or not there is this infinite and eternal sea of undifferentiated consciousness uh, that obtains out beyond the physical limitations of the physical universe, the sum total of all the ultimate integers of matter in the universe. Is there an infinite and eternal sea of consciousness that for some reason enfolded the universe into being and condensed down into material manifestation these, uh, these inchoate quantum fields that manifest in these two different forms of matter, uh, mass and energy. That uh, The question as to what's going on there, why did that take place? Or has this always been going on? Uh, is, a, is a profound and fundamental theological question. Uh, but but in, in my own judgment, that it, it, I have no sense whatsoever that this is a fallen state, that our state of incarnation, the incarnation of consciousness in a material uh, uh, vehicle is, is a fallen state at all, but that we have an obligation to develop the other energy centers of our body so that we can in fact have those lower chakra energies properly contexted. That's all. And that when those who don't have these things developed fall prey completely to those drives and energies, they can, in fact, be quite frightening. You know, they are like hell's angels, you know, actually. And, uh, and Ku Klux Klan guys, and American Nazi Party guys, and, and things like that that you run into. And, but, but, you have, but you have to be compassionate and understand that it is just, uh, they just aren't aware of the other options and opportunities that they have. And so we have to figure out, you know, I'm no Pollyanna, you know, I don't sit there, when, when I'm sitting there taking the deposition of the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan of, of North uh, Carolina, uh, which I have done, uh, you know, and they've, they've driven 10 vehicles into a demonstration and gunned down, you know, six helpless demonstrators, you know, and then brag about it and, and wear to the deposition these, these five skulls on their lapel. You know, you're, you're sitting in the presence of what might be perceived as evil, kind of incarnated, okay? But, but the fact is that if you back up and understand that it's just, it's just a myopic kind of distortion of energy in, in their body, and, the, and that we have an obligation to reach out with compassion and try to salvage these, these beings, that is, that, that is the ultimate task that we have here during this incarnated state is to reach out and share these kind of visions with each other so that we can lift people up to their full capacity. And, and, but we are confronted by people who, who conduct themselves as though they are blind, uh, who they, they don't hear, they don't see, you know, and they certainly don't have a very intense experience of this unitive experience. But that's, but that's our job. Okay, just, yes? Question about the late John Mack. Um, yes. Do you believe uh, the, the the tragic accident that he suffered was indeed an accident? Oh yes. Yeah, I was I was on the phone I was on the phone with Danny, his son, within two hours of of him having been uh, hit by the taxi cab, and uh, we took the steps necessary to make sure that he was the guy was arrested. The guy was arrested. The guy's in prison now. You know, it was a drunk guy driving a taxi cab. And, uh, and, and John just stepped down off the, the curb. He was in London. He'd just gotten through doing a, a seminar on T.E. Lawrence at Oxford. And he just stepped off, stepped, off, stepped off the curb 
in like all true Americans, you know, looked out like that to make sure there were no cars coming, you know, <laughs> on the right hand side of the road and just got plastered by the taxi cab, you know. Uh, so, so we know who the guy is that did it. We, he's in jail. He's got no connections. We investigated the guy. There's nothing to that. It was one of those bizarre turns of events. Uh, I believe you said you got involved in this uh, subject in 77, so that's yes. a while. And in light of what you were just talking about, uh, how Washington actually works mm -hmm. rather than the way you think it works, yeah. Because of your being outspoken on this topic and being out front about it, in all those years, have you ever uh, been verbally, physically, financially, or professionally threatened or had any uh, ill consequences because of your stance yeah. on this? All of the above. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all of those. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've had, I've had a contract put out to kill me. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, $50,000, it was a disgrace. You know, I mean, but, but it, it, turns out, it turns out that it was put out by the, by the nephew of the head of the 2506 Brigade down in Miami, which is one of those right-wing uh, anti-Castro Cuban groups. And he was, he, he, was basically just, uh, he was basically just trying to show off for his uncle and uh, put out a $50,000 contract to have me killed, at which point my chief of security, you know, uh, found out about it and uh, went to visit the guy's house and uh, uh, introduced him, asking for him by his nom de guerre. Uh, and his wife went to the, and got him, brought him out. And so my guy, my guy just reached out and took his hand like that and said, hi. He said, my name's Bill Taylor. I'm the chief of security for Dan Sheehan and the Christic Institute. And I know right where you live. And then turned around and walked away. And then it was off. And it was gone. You know, and I've been fired. I've been fired. Is it? Oh, did it go away? All right. Okay. All right. That, uh, I don't want to, wait, we're, it's, it's 10 o'clock, and uh, we're not supposed to be going much past this. So let's just, well, let's do one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> okay? And, uh, about two, two, two. It says, uh, okay, Eric says two. Forty-seven at Roswell. Mm -hmm. Dorothy Kilgallen went there yes. and um, investigated. Yep. And uh, she came back and she kind of was hushed, but she um, became friends with uh, Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. and they both were trying to get information, and she was trying to get information from. President Kennedy to see what he could find out. And I was wondering if that particular, he was not allowed to go in to find this information. I was wondering if that might have been part of the reason he was assassinated. Well, there's, there's, there's an old story. Uh, uh, Percy Foreman <laughs> once told me, Percy Foreman was a, a big famous criminal defense attorney down in Texas, you know, big six foot seven guy that weighed like 300 pounds and was this great big bruiser guy. And uh, he, he did more first degree murder trials than anybody else in the country. And I've met, I've met most of the really top trial lawyers in the country, uh, like, like Percy Foreman. I worked with F. Lee Bailey, who was one of his partners at the law firm. I've done trials with Jerry Spence and, and others. And what, uh, what Percy told me one time, he said, look, Dan, in, in murder cases, uh, if a person has been murdered, most of the time they deserved it. And if they deserved it from one person, they usually deserved it from more than one. That's what he said. And in my analysis of the stuff, because I was, I was in, the, uh, in the office of F. Lee Bailey when we represented James McCord, uh, the Watergate burglar that was the wiretap specialist, and we're the ones that got him to write the letter to Judge Sirica, blowing the whistle on Richard Nixon and the plumbers that led to the impeachment of Richard Nixon. And uh, I know a great deal about what that was all about. And uh, in fact, in short, since we have other people, we have to that 
that the Watergate burglary was directly connected to the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, and, uh, and I know how it was and why it was, etc. And while there were a number of different people that might have wanted to kill President Kennedy, uh, I, I happen to know precisely who did do it and how they did it and how they went about doing it, etc. And there, there's, there are a mix of motives involved in the, in the coalition of people that were involved in doing it. But uh, to this date, uh, I have no uh, suspicion uh, that it really involved the UFO issue. And I, but I, I know what the other issues were that it did involve. What's your take on a breakaway civilization? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's, uh, I, I, I always uh, seek recourse to that old thing is that, you know, I, I, I don't get paid to guess. So if people really want to know about these things, if they want to put together an adequate uh, team of people, and an adequate funding. I, I don't charge for the stuff that I do. I mean, I do everything for free, basically. But the, I have to hire investigators. I hire experts and specialists and scientists to do tests and stuff like that. And so that if people really want to find out about that, they can put together a group of people. We would be able to find out whether that's true. Is that one of the things I've learned about uh, doing lawyering is you never, you never want to be more committed to the objective than your client does. And so that if people who suspect that to be true, you know, want to just, you know, entertain themselves with the idea and kind of, you know, titillate themselves with it, they can do that. But if they really want to find out about it, that we can put together a team and find out about it. But that's one I don't know. I've never been asked to investigate. What was it? The breakaway, the, the breakaway civilization. What, what, do we, what, do, what do I believe about the fact that there is such an elite group of people that are involved in knowing about the extraterrestrial issue in their technology, et cetera, that they have actually lifted up and established an entire other civilization, that they've got bases on the moon, bases on Mars, uh, have a secret space program. There's a whole series of factors that go into that. Uh, and all I'm saying is at the present time, I have seen three or four different entirely bogus uh, stories about that that I, that I know are not true. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't others that are. But, but uh, as of right now, I don't know about that. But it's one of those things that I've been uh, asked to represent someone about. Uh, and I've got to go talk with them and see how serious they are about that. So just a two, wait, what you say three, three, one more. One more. Okay, but you already did one. Okay. Uh. Okay. Um, so with all the elite groups that we've heard about over the years, the uh, Rockefellers, Bilderbergs, Rothschilds, Carlisle Group, is there any one of those groups right now currently you think has more of an influence on what's going on in the world and, and possibly the United States? Yes, but none of those that you named. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's it's okay. No, but but, that, but there is a, there is another group. Are yeah. You okay. <laughs> so, so, okay. One, 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 uh, yeah. No, it's 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 presently it's presently uh, in the process of being investigated in great detail, and uh, and you you will know about it. You you will know about it sooner than later. Uh, actually, yes, it was, uh, it was pretty easy, actually. Uh, the, the question is, what, what was the actual set of tactics and strategy that, that I used to help maintain uh, Dr. Mack's position at Harvard? It, it's, it's, it's actually, you know, with, with all, the, all the studying you do at Harvard College, Harvard Law School, and Divinity School, because it, it comes down to a certain kind of simple attachment to truth. And what, all that I did is I kept saying, wait a second, this is ridiculous. You know, to have Harvard University, the faculty committee, who is dedicated to, to freedom, academic freedom and free speech to basically be threatening a professor who's a tenured professor is just basically ludicrous. And so what, what we did is John Mack and I went to uh, visit uh, uh, Lawrence Rockefeller and spent the weekend with him. And Lawrence Rockefeller was so excited about this opportunity of the Harvard University threatening uh, Dr. Mack that he agreed, at my request, to provide whatever money was necessary 
in order to put on what would amount to a grand rounds for the Harvard faculty about the, about the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence and about the various UFO sighting incidents. And, uh, and so what, what I did is when we showed up at the next uh, hearing, uh, we, we, got, we, came, we came into the next hearing, we sat down, and uh, uh, what was his name, Dr. John, uh, sorry with an R, but anyway, uh, he was a urologist uh, who was on the medical school faculty. He was chairing the committee. I thought that was very apt. Uh, and anyway, and so, so we, we come in and we sit down, and he says, uh, uh, okay, okay, Dr. Mack, where we were uh, questioning you before you got your counsel here, and I said, hold, excuse me, excuse me. I said, look it, can, uh, you know, uh, I, I just got to ask, is, can you tell me exactly what it is that we're doing here? You know, what, what, this isn't an AAUP convened hearing, the Association of American University Professors that actually can challenge tenure. You know, you don't have any, you got, but you've got the, the, the dean of the medical school sitting here. You've got the general counsel for Harvard University. You've got four faculty members from the, from the medical school. You know, exactly what is the purpose of this entire uh, hearing that we're having here? And, and he looked around and he said, well, Relman, his name, John Relman. He said, uh, well, uh, Mr. Sheehan, he said, when uh, Dr. Mack wrote this book, about abductions in contact with extraterrestrial beings, the dean of the medical school started getting lots of telephone calls uh, and asking him all kinds of questions uh, about what this was all about. And so we thought that it was a good idea to kind of get uh, Dr. Mack together with some of the faculty, sit down and, and uh, ask him some questions about what he was doing. And, uh, and he said, and so that's what we're basically doing here. And I said, oh, I said, that's, that's terrific. I said, uh, can you tell me who called? And he said, what? And I said, who, who called him to ask those questions? And, and he looks around like this, and the, and the, the, uh, the legal counsel for Harvard University goes, <laughs> like that. So he said, I'm sorry, uh, but we're not at liberty to really discuss that. I said, really? I said, OK, but if the purpose of our being here is to basically answer some of the questions that he was being asked in these telephone conversations, like, what were the questions that were asked? And he looked around like this, and he looked at the guy, the, the legal counsel from Harvard University, and he, they went. <laughs> so, so I'm sorry, but we're not at liberty to discuss that either. I said, really? I said, well, let me just ask you this. Can you tell me whether or not, in your judgment as the chair of this, this committee, that either one or both of the two factual questions that I'm going to identify here might come up and be the subject matter of these hearings? Number one, whether or not extraterrestrial intelligence actually exists. And number two, whether or not at least some of these UFO sightings might actually be a vehicle that is under intelligent control manned by beings from another extraterrestrial civilization. Are either one of these two fact questions possibly going to be at issue in these hearings? And he said, well, they definitely are. He said, and anybody who thinks that either one of those things is true, it's totally ridiculous. And I said, well, thank you very much. I said, so I think I just ought to inform you that we've just come from spending the weekend with Lawrence Rockefeller. He's given us all the money that we need to put on a major grand rounds for your entire faculty and explain to you what the data is. And, you know, I'll bring in numbers of witnesses from colonels and full generals in the military and from the Federal Aviation Agency and other places to present to the faculty since you're so interested in this issue. Uh, and that's what we're going to be doing the next time we appear here. Okay. And the, and the legal counsel from Harvard University jumped up like this and said, absolutely not. We're not going to have these hearings turned into some kind of a circus, what they said. And I said, oh, really? I said, well, I said, it was just already stated on the record by the chairman of the council that those two fact questions are at issue here. So I assume we're going to have the opportunity to present evidence on that. And when you get ready for that, you call us, OK? I got, come on, John, let's go. We're done. OK, and John's going, but, but, but. I said, up, 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 let's go. And we turned around and walked out, bang, like that. And they just folded just like that and, and terminated the hearings and, and uh, said they were sorry that they were misunderstood. Okay? <laughs>